So let's continue our discussion of augmentin. So we were discussing infections that can be treated with augmentin. So we got to urine infections. So I said that many urine infections will be sensitive to augmentin and therefore augmentin is often an effective treatment for UTI slash urosepsis. Uh, the difference, by the way, between those is urine tract, urinary tract infection, UTI, we use when the infection is less severe, so the person is less ill from the infection. Whereas urosepsis means that it's a urine infection that is making the person really, really unwell. It's making them septic. Uh, now, of course, for UTI, what you want to do is take a urine sample from the person, send it off to the laboratory, and they will take the urine and put it on a culture plate and try and actually grow uh, bugs from it so that they can actually find exactly what the bug is that is causing the urine infection. And then they'll test different antibiotics against that bug to find out which ones are effective. So if that comes back and shows that the infection is sensitive to augmentin and you've treated them with augmentin, fantastic. If it comes back showing that actually it's resistant to augmentin, then of course you change your antibiotic choice to one that it's actually sensitive to. But many urinary infections will be sensitive to augmentin, so it is something that is covered often by augmentin. Continuing on, so cellulitis, so this is an interesting one. Uh, so cellulitis is the infection of the subcutaneous tissue underneath the skin. Uh, it's usually caused by strep or staph. It causes redness, so clinically it's a really usually quite obvious infection and it often occurs in the legs but it can occur in the arms, it can occur on the trunk, although that's quite rare, it can even occur on the face. The legs is the main place you see it. Uh, and it spreads often quite quickly, uh, so through the subcutaneous fat spreading over uh, the leg, and you see it as redness, the tissue becomes really hyperemic, so blood supply goes massively up, uh, and that makes the tissue appear red, so you see it as a red patch of skin, the cellulitic portion. Now, the usual antibiotic that we would use to treat it is flucloxacillin, so I've written that down, flucloxacillin. At least in the UK, that would be our first choice for treating cellulitis. So flucloxacillin is another example of a penicillin antibiotic. In fact, it's in a group of penicillins known as the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. So penicillins, we divide them down further. So we have the original penicillins, which I've already mentioned, Benpen and Penv. Uh, and then another group is the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. And amoxicillin is not in this group of anti-staphylococcal penicillins. And remember, amoxicillin is the penicillin that's actually in augmentin. Examples of anti-staphylococcal penicillins are flucloxacillin, also mefacillin, which is famous from its role in the name for MRSA. MRSA, remember, is methicillin-resistant staphylococcal aureus. So it's a form of staph aureus that is even resistant to a penis, uh, an anti-staphylococcal penicillin, such as methicillin. Uh, another example is oxacillin. So there are a whole bunch of these anti-staphylococcal penicillins. The main one that we use in the UK is flucloxacillin. And because cellulitis can be caused by staph as well as strep, uh, strep, by the way, is hit by amoxicillin, fantastic. It's hit fantastically even by the original penicillins, Benpen and Penv. In fact, that's pretty much all that we use Benpen and Penv, the original ones, to treat anymore. It's strep infections. So, for example, if someone had a pharyngeal abscess, for example, uh, that's a throat infection, a really bad throat infection where it's formed an abscess. Uh, that's usually caused by strep, group A strep. And that would be really effectively treated by the original penicillins. That's pretty much all they can treat anymore, strep infections. And indeed, I actually had a patient recently with a pharyngeal abscess, which is the reason I brought that up. And we gave them uh, massive, massive doses of Ben, ben Pen intravenously, huge doses, doses that I've never seen prescribed before. Um, but back to the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. So those original penicillins aren't so effective against staph. Amoxicillin isn't so effective against staph, except when you combine it with clavulonic acid. Then, in augmentin, it can hit staph. However, it's still not the first-line choice. The first-line choice would usually be to prescribe an anti-staphylococcal penicillin, such as flucloxacillin or one of the other ones that might be used in other countries. So cellulitis, the first line choice would be flucloxacillin. However, be aware that augmentin, even though you wouldn't choose it usually as the treatment for cellulitis, it does 
it would work if you gave augmentin, it does actually work. Amoxicillin alone probably wouldn't work unless it was a strep infection. Um, but if it was a staph infection, it would likely be less effective. But augmentin could be used to treat cellulitis and would be effective. And in some cases, we actually do opt to use augmentin rather than flucloxacillin. In particular, when someone's been bitten by an animal or scratched by an animal, such as a cat or a pet dog, uh, and then uh, from the site of the bite or from the site of the scratch, the infection has then spread from there, uh, in that case, we usually do pick augmentin rather than flucloxacillin. The reason being is that flucloxacillin is not that broad. It's very good at treating staph and strep, which is why it's very good for cellulitis, but then it's not able to treat many other types of bacterial infections. And in the case where they've been bitten by an animal, it might be some very weird bacteria that is now causing the cellulitis rather than staph and strep, and augmentin is much more likely to hit that than flucloxacillin. So you can see cellulitis treated with augmentin in particular when it's been uh, caused from the sight of a bite or a scratch from an animal. So apologies, I previously spelt anti-staphylococcal incorrectly, I missed this Y here, so this is now the correct spelling of anti-staphylococcal. So let's continue on and talk about the next type of infections that can be treated with augmentin, and these are biliary infections. So these are infections of the biliary system, and these tend to make people really, really sick. They're not nice infections at all. So they usually make people profoundly sepsis, and we would call that biliary sepsis, sepsis arising from biliary infections. So the anatomy, firstly, of the biliary system, hopefully you know this, so the liver produces bile and it has a whole bunch of tubes inside of it that drain the bile and all of these tubes coalesce into one great big tube that is the common bile duct and this goes down from the liver to join onto the first portion of the intestine, the duodenum, and then all the bile from the liver is draining into that first portion of the intestine. To complicate the anatomy, you then have the gallbladder as a separate structure, which is like just a sac. Uh, and it's connected to the common bile duct by a small little tube. And some of the bile will go into the gallbladder and be stored there. And then at the time when you have a meal, the gallbladder contracts and pushes all of that bile out. And it will then all go down the common bile duct into the duodenum in one go. So you'll get a massive bolus of bile suddenly released at the time of meal. And that's important because the bile helps with uh, the digestion of the food. In particular, it's important in the digestion and absorption of fats. Now, so that's a bit of basic anatomy and physiology. You can get infections in these systems. You can get infections in the gallbladder and you can get infections in the bile duct. So cholecystitis is when you've got an infection primarily in the gallbladder and then cholangitis is when you've got an infection in the bile duct. These infections nearly always are caused by people having gallstones. So the bile can actually uh, solidify over years. It doesn't happen quickly. Um, but over years, bile can actually solidify, crystallize, whatever the correct word for it is, and can form stones inside the gallbladder, and these are called gallstones. So I've written some of this down. So gallstones, the proper name for gallstones is actually cholelithiasis. That's the proper medical name for it. Uh, so having gallstones puts you at much more increased risk that you will get an infection in the bile duct. The presence of these solid structures inside the gallbladder that potentially can get infections on their surface and then the infection can then spread into the uh, gallbladder tissue. Uh, and of course, when your immune system is trying to clear that infection, it will be able to clear the infection from the actual living tissue, but it won't be able to clear any infection that's on the surface of the stones as well. So the stones put you at massively increased risk of getting an infection in your gallbladder. So most cases of cholecystitis are associated with cholelithiasis. Similarly, cholangitis is usually because you've got a stone stuck in your common bile duct. So sometimes the stones from the gallbladder, when the gallbladder contracts, they can end up going through the tube from the gallbladder and then getting stuck in the common bile duct. Alternatively, some people even get stones in their 
common bile duct after they've had their gallbladder removed. So common operation that surgeons do because of this problem of gallstones and cholecystitis is they remove the gallbladder because you don't actually need it. If you remove it, the person lives perfectly fine without it. Um, so some people have their gallbladder removed and then they still get stones in the common bile duct. So the stones can actually form there in the first place. And then there are again a risk for infection being set up there. So usually cholangitis is caused by there being a gallstone stuck in the common bile duct somewhere. And as I say, both of these infections, cholecystitis and cholangitis, they are often awful. Cholangitis, I would say, is worse. Cholangitis, I've seen people become so, so sick. Some of the sickest people I've ever seen have had cholangitis. And you fill them up with antibiotics, you fill them up with fluids, and they're still in cardiovascular collapse. Their blood pressure's like 70 or something. Uh, and they end up going to ITU for vasopressors or whatever else they do in ITU. Um, so these infections, they make people really, really sick. So these infections, cholecystitis and cholangitis, biliary infections, they can be treated with augmentin. In fact, in the hospital that I used to work in, not my current hospital, but the hospital I used to work in, uh, that was what we did. We put them on augmentin, intravenous augmentin for these infections. My current hospital, we don't do that. Instead, we put them on a combination of free antibiotics uh, called AMG, which is amoxicillin, metronidazole, and gentamicin. Um, it carries a much lower risk of causing the clostridial colitis that C. diff can cause. It also carries a much lower risk of causing drug-induced cholestasis that uh, augmenting can cause. The downside to it is that one, it's much more complicated for the nurses because instead of just there being one antibiotic that you're giving augmenting, it's now three antibiotics. So it's a lot more work uh, infusing a patient with free antibiotics multiple times a day uh, rather than um, just one. Also, gentamicin is one of the antibiotics in AMG. Um, and gentamicin is an antibiotic that can cause kidney damage. I've seen quite a lot of kidney um, acute kidney deteriorations because of gentamicin. It usually resolves after the gentamicin has been stopped, uh, but it can uh, reduce people's renal function temporarily for a while. So it's debatable which, which is better. Different hospitals have different protocols. Uh, as I say, you can treat bitter infections with augmentin and it does work.